Chapter 3 The Sephiroth In the previous chapter it was suggested that the Kabbalah is the most suitable system for the basis of our magical alphabet to which we shall be able to refer the sum total of all our knowledge and experience religious, philosophical and scientific. The Kabbalistic alphabet is, as we shall proceed to explain, an elaborate system of attributions and correspondences, a convenient method of classification enabling the philosopher to docket his experiences and ideas as he obtains them. It is comparable to a filing cabinet of 32 jackets in which an extensive system of information is filed. It would be fallacious for the student to expect a concrete definition of everything which the cabinet contains. That is a sheer impossibility for quite obvious reasons. Each student must work for himself once given the method of putting the whole of his mental and moral constitution into these 32 filing jackets. The necessity for personal work becomes apparent when one realizes that in normal business procedure, for instance, one would not purchase a filing cabinet with the names of all past, present and future correspondents already indexed. It becomes quite evident that a Kabbalistic cabinet, our 32 paths, has a system of letters and numbers meaningless in themselves, but as the files are completed, ready to take on a meaning different for each student. As experience increased, each letter and number would receive fresh accessions of meaning and significance, and by adopting this orderly arrangement we would be enabled to grasp our inner life much more comprehensively than might otherwise be the case. The object of the theoretical, as separate from the practical Kabbalah, insofar as the thesis is concerned, is to enable the student to do three main things. First, to analyze every idea in terms of the tree of life. Second, to trace a necessary connection and relation between every and any class of ideas by referring them to this standard of comparison. Third, to translate any unknown system of symbolism into terms of any known one by its means. To restate the above in a different way, the art of using our filing cabinet arrangement brings home to us the common nature of certain things, the, the essential difference between others, and the inevitable connection of all things. Moreover, and this is extremely important, by the acquisition of an understanding of any one system of mystical philosophy or religion, one automatically acquires, when relating that comprehension to the tree of life, an understanding of every system. <clears throat> so that ultimately, by a species of association of impersonal and abstract ideas, one gradually equilibrizes the whole of one's mental structure and obtains a simple view of the incalculable vast complexity of the universe. For it is written, equilibrium is the basis of the work. Unquote. Serious students will need to make a careful study of the attributions detailed in this work and commit them to memory. When by persistent application to his own mental apparatus, the numerical system with its correspondences is partly understood, as opposed to being merely memorized the student will be amazed to find fresh light breaking in on him at every turn 
as he continues to refer every item in experience and consciousness to this standard. One Kabbalist of recent years, Mr. Charles S. Jones, Frater Achad, pseudonym, writes, uh, writes as follows in his QBL. It is of primary importance that the details of the plan be memorized. This is possibly the chief reason why in the early times of the Kabbalah, the early times the Kabbalah was transmitted from mouth to ear and not in writing. For it only bears fruit insofar, at it, uh, insofar as it is first rooted in our minds. We may read of it, study it to some extent, juggle with it on paper and so on, but not until the mind itself takes on the image of the tree and we are able to go mentally from branch to branch, correspondence to correspondence, visualizing the process and thus making it a living tree, do we find that the light of truth dawns upon us and we have, as it were, succeeded in putting forth a shoot above the earth. Thus, as in the east of a young tree, finding ourselves in a new world, while yet our roots are firmly implanted in our natural element. And end note, yes, Achad, page 19 and 20. The Zohar itself speaks of a divine spiritual influence called Mesla. Metzla or Mesla meaning destiny which descends from Kether to Malkuth by way of the paths vivifying and sustaining all things <clears throat> the Zohar itself speaks of a divine spiritual influence called Mezla, which descends from Kether to Malkuth by way of the paths, vivifying and sustaining all things. By endeavoring to implant the roots of this living tree in our own consciousness, tending it daily with devotion, tenderness and perseverance, almost imperceptibly we shall find new spiritual knowledge springing up spontaneously within us. The universe will then begin to appear as a synthetic homogeneous whole and the student will discover that the sum total of his knowledge will become unified and find himself able to transmute 
even on the intellectual plane and find himself unable to transmute even and find himself able to transmute even on the intellectual plane the money into the one this is in the long run discarding all the inessentials the goal of every mystic no matter by which of the names he denominates his path and which of the various by roads he follows one other preliminary matter must be touched upon before actually attempting an exegesis of the Sephiroth many Kabbalists have referred to the, to the tree of life the 78 tarot cards which are a series of pictorial representations of the universe Eliphaz Levi writes in La Histoire de la Magie as follows the absolute hieroglyphical science had for its basis an alphabet of which all the gods were letters all the letters ideas all the ideas numbers and all the numbers perfect signs this hieroglyphical alphabet of which Moses made the great secret of his Kabbalah is the famous book of Thoth the leaves of this famous book are also called the Atus of Thoth the latter being the Egyptian god of wisdom Court de Gebelin remarks hmm. Court de Gebelin 1719 to 1784 a Protestant pastor and Freemason wrote his nine volume Le Monde Primitif in 1781 in the eighth volume he stated that the Tarot was the remains of an ancient Egyptian book of secret wisdom Court de Gebelin Paris 1781 remarks were we to hear that there exists in our day a work of the ancient Egyptians <clears throat> one of their books which had escaped the flames which devoured their superb libraries and which contains their purest doctrines were we to add that this book for several centuries had been accessible to everyone would it not be surprising and would that not surprise be of be at its height where it asserted that people have never suspected it was Egyptian that they possess it in such a manner that they can hardly be said to possess it at all that no one has ever attempted to decipher a single leaf and that the outcome of a recondite wisdom is regarded as a mass of extravagant designs which mean nothing in themselves yet this is a true fact in one word this book is the pack of tarot cards The legend as to the origin of these 78 artus is a most curious and interesting one indeed although one cannot vouch for its accuracy it goes that the adepts of antiquity seeing that a cycle of spiritual degradation and mental stagnation was about to descend upon Europe with the advent of what is called the Christian era were preoccupied with the making of plans for the preservation of their accumulated knowledge 
it would be held in reserve for the age when men would be sufficiently advanced and spiritually unbiased to receive it, and yet available during the intervening period, even during the cycle of complete intellectual slothfulness, so that any member of the community who felt the inner urge to engage in the studies with which the Kabbalah, in particular, deals would obtain easy access to it. In conference assembled within the sanctuary of the Gnosis, they began considering the subject in all its aspects. One adept had furthered the idea of reducing all their knowledge to a few symbols and glyphs, and hewing these into imperishable rock, as was done by King Asoka in India. Others were for the writing up of their knowledge as it stood, and storing the manuscripts in vast subterranean libraries, such as Blavatsky narrates exist today in Tibet, to be opened at a much later date. None of these, however, satisfied the majority as fulfilling the required conditions, until one adept, who had hitherto sat reclining, taking but little part in the discussions, spoke somewhat as follows. There is a much more practical yet subtle method. Let us reduce all our knowledge of man and the universe to symbols which can be portrayed in pictures suitable for use as an ordinary game. In such a manner, the accumulated wisdom of the ages will be preserved in an unorthodox way, passing unnoticed by the herd as being the philosophy of the initiates, and yet throwing more than a third more, more than a hint to one in search of the truth. This suggestion, admirable in every way, was agreed upon by the assembly, and one of their number, an adept skilled in the work of brush, ink and pen, painted a set of 78 hieroglyphs, each representing symbolically some particular aspect of life, man, and the cosmos. And so these cards have come down to us today intact and practically unspoiled. It is true that some artists, neither skilled in the intricacies of the Holy Kabbalah, nor adepts as were the originators of the cards in painting copy sets of the tarot cards, have, have woefully mis misrepresented, misplaced, and in some cases entirely omitted some of the symbols existing on the original set of pictures. Yet everyone with the knowledge of the arcane wisdom can reconstruct them with ease. Claims of this sort, that the tarot, tarot is of ancient origin, were made by Court de Gebelin, Eliphas Levi, Paul Christian, 1811 to 1877, and others. However appealing this legend may be, there are simply no facts to back it up. Characteristics of the tarot suggest it dates from the Renaissance period. The earliest surviving tarot trumps still in existence date from about 1450 CE. What was through thought to be the earliest tarot, car, tarot deck, the Gringoner Tarot, painted for Charles VI in 1392, has recently been dated to only the middle of the 15th century and is of Venetian origin. The oldest known tarot deck was painted for the Visconti Sforza family in Milan around 1428 CE. It was only in the last century that we had the statement of Eliphas Levi that where a man incarcerated in a dungeon cell in solitary confinement, without books or instructions of any kind, it would still be possible for him to obtain from this set of car cards an encyclopedic knowledge of the essence of all sciences, religions 
and philosophies. Ignoring this specimen of typical Levi verbosity, it is only necessary to point out that instead of using the ten digits and the twenty-two letters of the Hebrew alphabet for the basis of his magical alphabet, Levi adopted as his fundamental framework the twenty-two trump cards of the Book of Thoth, attributing to them his knowledge and experience in a way similar to the attributions of the thirty-two paths of wisdom. Some critics have ventured the opinion that the interpretation of the tree of life suggested herein, its utilization as a mode of classification does not ring true, and that it has no authority in the standard work of the Kabbalah. This criticism is utterly without foundation in fact. An attempt in this direction is most evident in the Sefer Yetzira and the Sefer HaZohar, is replete with the most recondite attributions, many of which I have not reproduced here at all for the sake of maintaining simplicity. I can only recommend that those who bring forward these and similar objections should carefully refer to Mr. Waite's epitome of Zoharic philosophy, the secret doctrine in Israel, which substantially demonstrates that the basis of my interpretation has the sanction of the highest Kabbalistic authority. As stated in our book, this is from the, um, the Ciceros. As stated in our book, the New Golden Dawn Ritual Tarot, whether or not the original creators of the Tarot in intended to create a pictorial, sy pictorial system that would explain the basic principles of the Kabbalah is unimportant. It is irrefutably evident that the two systems fit together so completely that one explains the other, and both paint to the same divine truths. Page 1 Let us now approach the exegesis of the philosophy of the Kabbalah in its various aspects. First, we shall deal more fully with the ten Sephirothal ideas, giving the student in a later chapter examples of the mode of treatment which he himself will then be able to follow in studying the attributions of all the paths. Zero. Ein, Ein. The universe, as the sum total of all things and living creatures, is conceived as having its primeval origin in infinite space. Ein, nothing. Paramahanam. <clears throat> Parabrahman, a Sanskrit term meaning beyond Brahma, the supreme and the absolute principle, which is impersonal and nameless. In the Veda, it is referred to as that. The causeless cause of all manifestation, to quote the Zohar, before having created any shape in the world, before having produced any form, he was alone, without form, resembling nothing, 
who could comprehend him as he then was before creation, since he had no form? The Ein is not a being, it is no thing. Ein, nothing, along with Ein Sof, limitless, and Ein Sof Aur, the limitless light, comprise the three negative veils of existence. These veils are planes of existence that lie outside of all human realms of experience and understanding. Ein is the outermost veil. The Ein Sof is what we in our limited understanding refer to as God, which is completely beyond our, our comprehension. The Ein is not a being, it is no thing. That which is incomprehensible, unknown, and unknowable does not exist, at least to be more accurate insofar as our own consciousness is concerned. Blavatsky defines this primal reality as an omnipresent, eternal, and boundless principle on which all speculation is utterly impossible. Since it is since it so transcends the power of human conception and thought that it would only be dwarfed by any similitude. That which is known and named is known and named not from a knowledge of its substance, but from its limitations. In itself, it is unknowable, unthinkable, and unspeakable. Rabbi Azariel ben Menachem, born 1160 AD, a disciple already mentioned of Isaac the Blind, states that the Ein can neither be comprehended by the intellect nor described in words, for there is no letter or word to grasp it. In another very important system, this idea is very picturesquely and graphically represented as the goddess knew it. Knew it is Crowley's own rendition of the name of the Egyptian sky goddess Nut. Coptic Nuet, created specifically to fit his specific system of Gematria. The queen of absolute space and the naked brilliance of the night sky blue. The woman, quote, jetting forth the milk of the stars or cosmic dust from her paps, unquote. It is the absolute or the unknowable of the agnosticism or of Herbert Spencer. The thrice great darkness of the Egyptian sacerdotal caste. And the Chinese Tao, which resembleth the emptiness of space. Tao is Chinese for the way absolute or no humanal reality and which quote hath no father it is beyond all other conceptions higher than the highest unquote in one of the meditations of Chuang Tzu we find that quote Tao cannot be existent. 
if it were existent, it could not be non-existent. Tao is something beyond material existences. It cannot be conveyed, either by words or by silence, in that state which is neither speech nor silence, its transcendental nature may be apprehended." Unquote. Chuang Tzu was an important early interpreter of Chinese Taoism. His work, Chuang Tzu, is considered one of the essential texts of Taoism. Chuang Tzu's teachings had a great influence on the development of Chinese Buddhism as well as Chinese poetry and landscape painting. To this Kabbalistic conception or principle of zero would be allocated Baruch Spinoza's definition of God or substance, quote, that which requires for its conception the conception of no other thing, unquote. Another of the many symbols used by the Hindus to represent this zero was that of the serpent Ananta, which enclosed the universe its tail being swallowed in its mouth represented the re-entrant nature of infinity. The thousand-headed serpent Ananta, meaning endless, that issued from Balarama's mouth, the god Vishnu's attendant upon whom he rests during the night of Brahman on the ocean of milk, in ancient Egypt and Greece, the symbol of Uruburus, the serpent with its tail in its mouth, expressed the unity of all things, both material and spiritual, which continuously change form in cycles of destruction and recreation. Next Sephiroth, number one, Kether. To become conscious of itself, or to render itself comprehensible to itself, Ein becomes Ein Sof, infinity, and still further, Ein Sof Aur, absolute, limitless light. The Daiva Prakriti of the Brahman Vedantists and the Adi Buddha or Amitabha of the Buddhists Daiva Prakriti meaning God level and the Adi Buddha In Mahayana Buddhism, the first eternal Buddha, it is said that from the Adi Buddha evolved the five Dhyani Buddhas, self-born Buddhas who have always existed. In art, the Adi Buddha is represented as a crowned Buddha dressed in rich garments and wearing the traditional ornaments of a bodhisattva. Adi Buddha or Amitabha. Amitabha, a Sanskrit name meaning 
infinite light. In Buddhism, the great savior deity. And the Adi Buddha or Amitabha of the Buddhists, which then by contraction concentrated itself into a central dimensionless point. Contraction, the word symptom. Symptom is the process described by Lurianic Kabbalah in which Kether was created. The Ein Sof contracted from the surrounding light, not unlike an empty set of lungs inhaling to gather in and contain and therefore limit the air. concentrated itself into a central dimensionless point, Kether, the crown, which is the first tefira on the tree of life. Another way in which this same idea has been expressed is that within the concept of abstract negativity, the whirling forces, Rashist, Ha Hilgilgulim presaged the first manifestation of the primordial point, Nekuda Rishona, a title of Kether, which becomes the primeval root from which all else will spring. Kether is the inscrutable monad, the unity or the one. The root of all things, defined by Leibniz with reference both to the ultimate nature of physical things and to the ultimate unit of consciousness, as a metaphysical point, a center of spiritual energy unextended and unindivisible, full of ceaseless life, activity and force. It is the prototype of everything spiritual and indeed of all else in the cosmos. Baron Gottfried Wilhelm von Leibniz, 1646 to 1716 was a German philosopher and mathematician who invented integral and differential calculus independently of Newton. It is the prototype of everything spiritual and indeed of all else in the cosmos. In this connection, the reader will do well to bear in mind the following extract from the mysterious universe, universe wherein Sir James Jeans writes. This shows that an electron must, in a certain sense at least, occupy the whole of space. They, Faraday and Maxwell, pictured an electrified particle which threw out lines of force throughout the whole of space. Page 55 and 54 and 55. Michael Faraday, 1791 to 1867 
one of the greatest scientists of the 19th century, was a British chemist and a physicist who, in 1831, discovered electromagnetic induction and proposed the field theory, later elaborate, elaborated by Maxwell and Einstein. He discovered how to produce an electric current from a magnetic field. He also invented the first electric motor. James Clark Maxwell, 1831 to 1879, made important contributions to electromagnetic theory and the kinetic theory of gases. He is considered the 19th century scientist who had the greatest influence on 20th century physics. His research was expounded in his Treatise on Electricity and Magnetism, 1873. The scientific conception or the mathematical electron which occupies the whole of space would correspond to the Kabbalistic conception of Kether in the world of Asia. The four worlds are explained in chapter 7. In the Kabbalah are included what are known as the ten Sephiroth. There is some little speculation as to what these imply. Ten numbers ten words or ten sounds. The general implication of Cordovero is that they are substantive principles or Kalim. In his Sefer Elima, Cordovero says that during the act of emanation the divine substance flows into vessels or instruments the kelim, which become increasingly less refined as the process of manifestation continues downward. Nevertheless, there is not a single vessel wherein the essence of the Ein Sof is lessened or diminished in any way. The general implication of Cordovero is that they are substantive principles or kelim, vessels of force or categorical ideas through which the consciousness of the universe expresses itself. A metaphorical passage from the Zohar states on this point that the waters of the sea are limitless and shapeless, but when they are spread over the earth, they produce a shape. The source of the waters of the sea and the force which it emits to spread itself over the soil are two things. Then an immense basin is formed by the waters just as it formed when one makes a very deep digging. This basin is filled by the waters which emanate from the source. It is the sea itself and can be regarded as a third thing. This very large hollow of waters is split up into seven canals which are like so many long tubes by means of which the waters are conveyed. The source, the current, the sea, and the seven canals form together the number ten. The passage then goes on to explain that the source or primary cause of all things is Kether, the first Sephira. The current issuing therefrom, the primeval mercurial intelligence, 
is Shokma. The second and the sea itself is the great mother, Bina. And the third, the seven canals referred to being the seven lower sephirah, or inferiors, as they are called. The Kabbalists postulated ten sephiroth because to them ten was the perfect number, one which included every digit without repetition and contained the total essence of all numbers. Isaac Myers writes that zero one ends with one zero, and Rabbi Moses Cordovero in his Pardis Rimonim soliloquizes that the number ten is an all embracing number. Outside of there or outside of it there exists no other. For what is beyond ten returns again to units. Kether, the crown, is then the first sephira. As the first cause or demiurgos, it is also called macroprosopus, or the great countenance in the Zohar. the vast countenance or great force. Arik Anpin is one of the Partsufim or faces. The number one has been defined by Theon of Smyrna. Theon was a notable Greek mathematician and astronomer of the late 4th century. He made an extensive commentary on Ptolemy. His daughter was Hypatia. The number one has been defined by Theon of Smyrna as the principle and element of numbers which, while multitude can be lessened by subtraction, and is itself deprived of every number, remains stable and firm. Unquote. The Pythagoreans said that the monad is the beginning of all things, and gave it, according to Photius, the names of God, the first of all things, the maker of all things, it is the source of ideas. Photius, 820 to 891, was a leading figure of the 9th century Byzantine Renaissance. To each Sephira, the doctrinal Kabbalah attributes intelligences variously called gods. Dion Chohans, similar to archangels, the term Dihan Chohan is Hindu, not Kabbalistic. To each Sephira, the doctrinal Kabbalah attributes intelligences variously called gods, Dion Chohans, angels, and spirits etc. For the whole universe in this philosophy is guided and animated by whole series of these hierarchies of sentient beings, each with a particular function and mission, varying in their respective degrees and states of consciousness and intelligence. There is but one indivisible and absolute consciousness thrilling throughout every particle and infinitesimal point in the manifested universe in space. But its first differentiation by emanation or reflection is purely spiritual and gives rise to a number of 
beings which we may call gods. Their consciousness being of such a nature, of such a degree of sublimity as to surpass our comprehension. From one point of consideration, the gods are the forces of nature, their quote-unquote names are the laws of nature. They are therefore eternal, omnipresent, and omnipotent. Only, however, for the cycle of time, almost infinite through it be, though it be, wherein they are manifest, manifested or projected. The names of the gods are important, for according to magical doctrine, to know the name of an intelligence is at once to possess peculiar control of it. Professor W. M. Flinders Petrie, in his little work on the religion of ancient Egypt, states that the knowledge of the name gave power over its owner. Sir William Matthew Flinders Petrie, 1853 to 1942, was a British archaeologist and Egyptologist. He made valuable contributions to the methods of archaeological field excavation, which he described in his book Methods and Aims in Archaeology, 1904. Petrie made important discoveries in the al Fayyim region of Egypt, as well as the ancient sites of Abydos and Thebes. Professor W. M. Flinders Petrie, in his little work on the religion of ancient Egypt, states that the knowledge of the name gave power over its owner we find attributed to the crown the first digit the attribution of the god name of Ahaya translated by I will be, signifying definitely that the scheme of nature is not a static one, nor a system of existence wherein the creative processes have long been consummated, but vibrant, progressive, and ever-becoming. Its Egyptian gods are Ptah, who again according to Professor Flinders Petrie, was one of the abstract gods, as, disting as distinguished from, from human or cosmic gods, and the creator of the cosmic egg, and Amon-Ra, with whom Osiris became identified king of the gods. And, quote, Lord of the Thrones of the World, unquote. Its Greek equivalent is Zeus, identified in the Roman Theogony as Jupiter, the greatest of the Olympian gods, and is generally represented as the omnipotent father and king of gods and men. The Romans considered Jupiter as the Lord of Heaven, the highest and most powerful among the gods, and called him the best and most high. In the Indian system, he is Brahma, the creator. Brahma is a masculine force, not to be confused with Brahman, the supreme force of the universe which is gender-neutral. 
In the Indian system, he is Brahma, the creator, from whom sprang the seven Prajapati. Prajapati is Sanskrit for Lord of Creatures, one of the creator deities of ancient India during the Vedic period. Altogether, the Prajapati are the mind-born children of Brahma, who are related to the seven great Arsis, or ancient sages. He is Brahma, the creator, from whom sprang the seven Prajapati, our seven lowest Sephiroth, who at his behest completed the creation of the world. The diamond is attributed to Kether because it is the most prominent and glittering of precious jewels. For various reasons too, the ancients made the swan a correspondence of this digit. In the legends of all peoples, the swan is the symbol of spirit and ecstasy. The Hindu legends narrate that the swan, Hansa, when given milk mixed with water for its food, separated the two, drinking the milk and leaving the water. This being supposed to show its trans transcendent wisdom. The hawk also is a correspondence. Bearing in mind that Kether is the monad, the individual point of view, we can understand that the hawk is so attributed because it has the habit of remaining poised in mid-air, looking down from the blue ether to earth and beholding all things with the eye of utter detachment. Ambergris, that rarest and most precious of perfumes, while having little perfume in itself, is most admirable as the basis of compounds, bringing out the best of any other with which it may be mixed. This also finds its place in this category of ideas. The color attributed to Kether is white. Its tarotic attributions are the four aces and it is called in the Sefer Yetzirah the admirable and hidden intelligence. According to Rabbi Azariel's commentary on the ten Sephiroth, each of the Sephiroth has three distinct qualities. First, it has its own Sephirothal function, already described. Its secondary aspect is that it receives from the previous Sephiroth, or from above, in the case of Kether. And third, it transmits its own nature, and that received from above, to those Sephiroth below. The next two, Chokma. The first Sephira, the essence of being, spirit, matter, contained in essence and potentiality the nine, the other nine Sephiroth, and gave rise to them in a process which can be mathematically stated. S. Little MacGregor Mathers asks, how is number two to be found? He answers the question in his introduction to the Kabbalah unveiled. By reflection of itself, for 
although zero be incapable of definition, one is definable. And the effect of a definition is to form an eidolon, duplicate or image of the thing defined. Thus then, we obtain a duad composed of one and its reflection. Now also, we have the commencement of a vibration establishment established, for the number one vibrates alternately from changelessness to definition and back to changelessness. Mathers, page 23. Isaac Ibn Latif, 1220 to 1290 AD, also furnishes us with a mathematical definition of the processes of evolution. As the point extends and thickens into a line, the line into the plane, the plane into the expanded body, so God's manifestation unfolds itself. If we try for a moment to think what is the ultimate differentiation of existence, we shall find that so far as we can grasp it, it is a plus and minus, positive and negative, male and female, and so we should expect on the tree of life to find that the two emanations succeeding Kether partake of these characteristics, we ascertain that the second Sephira, Chokma, or quote-unquote wisdom, is male, vigorous, and active. It is called the Father, the divine name being Yoh. And the other and the choir of angels appropriate being the opranim. Opranim means wheels. It is based on the Hebrew word of, which means to surround, to encircle. and on Yo. Although it is ultimately considered half of the tetragrammaton YHVH Yo or Yah is as it is more commonly referred to is sometimes listed as having an approximate meaning of the Lord. Night, a practical guide to Kabbalistic symbolism, page 249. It signifies masculine force. Tahuti, or Thoth, is attributed to this Sephira of wisdom, for he was the god of writing, learning, and magic. Thoth is represented as an ibis-headed god and occasionally has an ape or baboon in attendance. Pallas Athena, insofar as she is the giver of intellectual gifts and one in whom power and wisdom were harmoniously blended. The goddess of wisdom who sprang full-armed from the brain of Zeus is attributed to Chokma. In Greek mythology, she appeared as the preserver of human life and instituted the ancient court of the Areopagus of Athens.
the Areopagite Council was the earliest aristocratic council of ancient Athens. The word Areopagite is based on Areopagus or Ares Hill, a hill northwest of the Acropolis where meetings were held. She also she is also Minerva in the Roman system, whose name is considered by philologists to contain the root of mens, to think. She is, accordingly, the thinking power personified. Mart, the goddess of truth, linked with Thoth, is another Egyptian correspondence. Uranus as the starry heavens and Hermes as the logos and the transmitter of the influence from Kether also are attributions. In Taoism the positive Yang would correspond to this Sephira. Chokma is the vital energizing element of existence. Spirit or the Purusha of the Sankhyan philosophy of India by which is implied the basic reality underlying all manifestations of consciousness. Purusha is Sanskrit for person or spirit. It refers to the eternal unchanging self in Samkhyan philosophy, the Purusha is in opposition to Prakriti or matter. The bondage of the human soul is caused by a confusion of Purusha with Prakriti. Freedom from this bondage is brought about by a disassociation of Purusha from Prakriti. Chokma is the vital energizing element of existence, spirit, or the Purusha of the Sankhyan philosophy of India, by which it implied the basic reality underlying all manifestations of consciousness. In Blavatsky's system, Chokma would be what is there named Mahat or Cosmic Ideation. Cosmic Ideation, Mahat or Intelligence, the Universal World Soul, the Cosmic No Humanon of Matter the basis of the intelligent operations in and of nature, also called Maha Buddhi. Blavatsky, page 12. Mahat is a Sanskrit word for the Great One. It is the first principle of universal intelligence and consciousness. It is the producer of manas, the thinking principle. Cos Chokma would be what is there named Mahat or cosmic ideation. With the Buddhists of China, this is Quan Shi Yin. Vishnu and Ishvara with the Hindus. When the neutral absolute reality of Brahman takes on attributes, it becomes Ishvara, God or Overlord. Ishvara is said to have three aspects, Brahma, Shiva and Vishnu.
Shokma is the word, the Greek logos, is the word, the Greek logos, and the memra of the Targum. Targum is Aramaic for translation or interpretation. It alludes to any of the various Aramaic translations of the Hebrew Bible. Written after the Babylonian exile in a time when Aramaic replaced Hebrew as the spoken language of the Jews. These translations were devised to bring the knowledge of the Old Testament to the common people. And the Memra of the Targum. The Sefer Yetzira names it, quote, the illuminating intelligence. Its planet is Uranus, although traditionally the sphere of the zodiac is allocated there too. Its color is gray. The colors attributed to the Sephiroth are from the Golden Dawn's queen scale of color. For more on the four color scales of the Golden Dawn, see our books Experiencing the Kabbalah, page 227 and 228, or The New Golden Dawn Ritual Tarot, page 26 to 28. Its color is gray, its perfume the Orchidic Musk, plant the Amaranth, which is the flower of immortality, and the four twos of the tarot. Its precious stones are the star ruby, representing the male energy of the creative star, and the turquoise suggesting Masloth, the sphere of the zodiac. The Zohar also attributes the Chokma, the first letter Yod, of the Tetragrammaton, a formula which will be more fully explained later. The Yod also has attributed to it the four kings of the Tyrant. The attributions of the Tetragrammaton should be very carefully followed, for much of Zoharic speculation devolves upon them. <laughs>